Hey everybody, it's Tuesday, March 2nd, and as you can see here in the AIM today, our goal for today's video is to go over how we can use the concept of center of mass to solve problems. Now, before we do that, I want to just very briefly review the problem that was posed at the end of the video yesterday. The problem that was posed at the end of the video yesterday was a, a ballistic pendulum problem. And the ballistic pendulum problem was in that simulator. It looked a little bit like this. And so what I asked you to do was to set the mass of the bullet all the way to the right. So that made it 0 0.1 kilograms. To set the initial velocity of the bullet all the way to the right, which made it some unknown value. And then to keep the mass of the wooden block, 4 kilograms. Now, there were a number of ways that you could have done this in terms of where you needed to set the zero mark. What some of you may have noticed is that if you put this line here for the height all the way at the very bottom of the block, or I should say at the very bottom of the slider, it touched the very bottom of the block. And so I decided to measure the height from there. And so notice once you fired this bullet here and it embedded itself in the block, the block fully swung up to its maximum height which notice when you move the slider up to the bottom, made the height change for this block 1.52 meters. Now, you should have gotten the same answer, or at least a very similar answer. Of course, we could all differ exactly on how we measure that the bottom of the block is touching this dotted line, or at the top of the block, or the middle of the block is touching the dotted line, wherever you made your measurements from. But your height change should be approximately 1.52 meters. And so that's what you need to use in your calculation. To be clear, it is neither right nor wrong to measure it from the bottom, from the middle, or from the top. Although I guess the only problem with measuring it from the top is that the slider doesn't go up that high. Either way, this should have been your measurement for the change in height. And so since that was your measurement for the change in height, your calculation should have looked a little something like this. So as we mentioned here, the mass of the bullet, which is what we're going to label M1 as, we set as 0 0.1 kilograms. The mass of the wooden block was 4 kilograms. The initial velocity V2 of that block was 0 meters per second since it was just sitting there before the bullet was fired. The change in height for the block was 1.52 meters. And we are looking for the initial velocity of the bullet, which we are going to call V1. Now, as we mentioned in the video yesterday, what you need to find first is the V prime of the bullet block system after the collision. And the way you do that is by using conservation of energy because the final velocity in the momentum problem is the initial velocity in the energy problem. And so what we'll say here is V prime for the momentum problem is equal to V naught for the energy problem. For the energy problem, what we have is that the initial kinetic energy of the bullet block system after the collision is equal to the gravitational potential energy of the bullet block system when it reaches its maximum height. And so we can set up our calculation here as one half m v naught squared equals m g delta y. Now, as we mentioned yesterday, this m and this m is really the sum of the masses because at this stage of the problem, the bullet and the block are already combined. However, it doesn't really matter, and we're not even going to bother to make that substitution, because since that term appears on both sides of the equation, it cancels. And so what we end up with then is 1 half V naught squared equals G delta Y. And so that means V naught, the initial velocity that this thing has for the energy problem, which is the velocity this thing has after the collision, the V prime in the collision problem, is just going to be 2G delta Y. And so when you plug in those numbers here, you get 2 times 9.8 meters per second squared, times 1.52 meters, that's our height. And when you do that math, 2 times 9.8 times 1.52, and you take the square root, you get your initial velocity in the energy problem is 5.46 meters per second. Now, that's if you use the height of 1.52. I saw some of your work already for some of you, and you got like 5.44 meters per second, because I think you might have used 1.51 meters. Either way, there's going to be some experimental error, if you will. And so that answer is good enough. Now, just to put a final pin in it here, the V prime then for the momentum problem 
is the V naught for the energy problem. And we'll say, so we'll say that number is also 5.46 meters per second. And now that we have that number, we're ready to go ahead and do our momentum analysis. And so our momentum analysis should look a little something like this. It's a perfectly inelastic collision here. So we have M1V1 plus M2V2 equals M1 plus M2 times V prime. Now, of course, because we said the block begins at rest, that has a velocity of zero. So that means the M2V2 term totally goes away. And what we're left over with is M1V1 equals M1 plus M2 times V prime. And so if we want to solve this for V1, all we have to do is divide both sides by M1. And so we get V1 equals M1 plus M2 times V prime over M1 is equal to V1. That's it. And so plugging in our numbers here, we have M1, which we said was 0 0.1 kilograms, plus M2, which we said was 4 kilograms, times V prime, which we just calculated as 5.46, although if you got a number that's slightly different from that, then you plug in your slightly different number. And then you divide that by the mass of the bullet, which was 0 0.1 kilograms. And when you do that math, you get 223.78 meters per second, which we can round to three significant figures. We can call it 224 meters per second. Of course, since the mass of the bullet, I believe, was only given as 0 0.1, then technically it should be 200 if you really want to follow the rules of significant figures, but this is good enough. And of course, if you plugged in 224 into the simulator, it would have said this answer was correct within 1%. I do believe if you used 1.51, your answer should have come out as 223 point something, and that point something was smaller than 0.5, so your answer to three sig figs would have rounded to 223. Either way, experimental uncertainty notwithstanding, that answer would be correct. And that's it for the ballistic pendulum. The most important thing you need to remember about the ballistic pendulum is you have to do the energy analysis first so you can find the V prime in the momentum collision, and then you can go back to this calculation to find the initial velocity of the bullet. And that's the deal. And with that, that's it for the ballistic pendulum. That brings us to the new topic for today, what we're going to spend the rest of this video on, center of mass. So I'd like you to write this under the heading, center of mass. There are a bunch of things that we can say about center of mass. And while I'd like you to realize that this is, in fact, a new topic, a lot of the things that we're saying here are really not that complicated. So the first thing that we can say here is, so far this year, we have been treating all objects as point masses, which really are objects with all of their mass located at exactly one point in space. Now, of course, this is not totally accurate because the masses of objects are actually spread out in space, right? If you just take the mass of like anything, like even this computer mouse that's sitting right next to me, the mass of the object is not all located at one point. It's spread out, uh, you know, in the total volume taken up by this object. That's the idea. And so despite the fact that the mass is spread out, you know, amongst all of the volume here that's taken up by this object, we can say that there is a point in space known as the center of mass, which is basically where all of the mass is concentrated. That point is the center of mass. And so what we'll say here for our definition of the center of mass is that the center of mass is a point in space, which represents the average location of all of the individual components of mass that make up an object. Take a second to pause this video here and write all this down. And when you hit play, we'll move on. So if you Google center of mass, you'll be able to find a calculation, an equation to be able to calculate center of mass. That's actually not required for this course. And so because it's not required, we're not going to spend any time on it. Honestly, if it was something that I thought would be really valuable to helping you understand how this works, I would have you do it, but it's really not. And so we're going to go ahead and leave that off. And so what we're going to discuss now is just really the stuff that you need to know to be able to answer AP questions. And so the first thing we want to mention here is how you locate the center of mass. And so 
These are key concepts for how to do that. The first thing we'll say is the location of an object's center of mass depends on the distribution of mass within that object. Some objects are uniform, some objects are not, and so we'll say the location of an object's center of mass depends on the distribution. Another important thing for you to understand is that the center of mass, regardless of whether or not the object is spinning, obeys Newton's laws of motion. Specifically, the first law is really what guides the motion. If the object is at rest, it has a tendency to remain at rest. And if the object is in motion, it has a tendency to remain in motion. So what that tells you about the center of mass is that if the center of mass is initially at rest, then it has a tendency to remain at rest. And if the center of mass is in motion, then it has a tendency to remain in motion. That's the key detail. And so to put a finer point on it here, essentially, the center of mass represents the location where a force exerted on the object will only cause the object to be translated in space. In other words, to move without rotating. If you have a ruler, you could sort of do this demonstration for yourself. If you put a ruler flat on your table and you push on it at the 8-inch mark, you will see that the object will move away from you if you're pushing it away from you, but it'll also begin to rotate. Same thing if you push on it at like the two inch mark, it'll rotate and move away from you. But if you push at it exactly at the six inch mark, exactly at the location of the center of mass, then you'll see that the object will just move forward without rotating. And that's the basic idea. Take a second to pause this video here and write that down. And when you hit play, we'll move on. Okay, so I just want to take a moment to drive home this point here about the center of mass obeying Newton's laws before we really get into how to locate it. And so here's a picture of an object in free fall. I wanted to show more of this image, so I put it sideways, but it's important to realize the gravitational acceleration is causing the object to accelerate down like this. And so what you notice here is that while this is an extended object, which is not uniform, right? Because the end of a wrench is heavier than the, the handle. The center of mass is located closer to the heavier part, which I think makes some intuitive sense. And so as a result, it rotates to the floor as you drop it. But the essential point is here, like a marble, which basically has all of its mass uniformly located, the center of mass falls in a straight line. So the whole idea about center of mass is that even if it's an extended object where the mass is spread out over a certain amount of space, the center of mass moves like any other object we've discussed this year. Let's take a projectile. If you take a hammer and you rotate it, it really looks kind of like it's flopping around all crazy. But if you actually look at what its center of mass is doing, you'll notice here that the center of mass follows a perfect parabola like any other projectile would. That's the idea. Now, another thing we can discuss before we actually discuss how to find the location of the center of mass is how you can do that in real life. Now, whether or not you remember this, you actually already did this in Honors Physics Lab. The way that we determine the center of mass experimentally is by using what we refer to as a plumb bob line. Basically, you take a heavy mass and you tie it to the end of a string and you put it at three different points on an object. So let's say you put it here, here, and here. And basically what you do is you just hang that rope from that point on the object and you trace the line. So you basically draw where the thing is hanging. Of course, because it's a plumb bob line and there's a very heavy mass on the end of the line, it's always going to hang straight down. And what you'll see when you do this from three different directions, notice for the three dimensions, then you'll get a point of intersection. That point of intersection is where the center of mass is located. Now, in this class, we are mostly going to be doing this for regular objects, uniform objects. So that means objects where the mass is uniformly distributed throughout space. So that would be like for a stick, 
and not for like a weird irregularly shaped object like this. Or the other uh, possibility is that we'll do it for like two objects which are connected by some rod in between where the two objects will have different masses. Basically, this is sort of like a simplified model of how the mass of an object actually exists as discrete little pockets of mass spread out through space. And what we can say here is the center of mass of a two-mass system, when the objects have equal masses, is directly between the two objects. If the masses are not equal, the center of mass is closer to the center of mass of the object with a larger mass. And I think that makes sense. What we can also say, which I think makes a heck of a lot of sense, is the center of mass of uniform objects is directly at the center of the objects. These are two very, very, very important points. The most practical points when it comes to answering questions in this course. So take a second to pause this video here and write these down. And when you hit play, we'll move on. All right, so as I mentioned, as far as the AP test questions are concerned, this is the most important concept. So let's make sure you actually understand this. Let's take a look at a question. This question here is showing you a diagram, and it's showing you the mass of object one. Let's first say that, notice, that second bullet point, I'm just going to flip back, the center of mass of uniform objects is directly at the center of the objects, is represented here. This is a uniform sphere, and it's showing the center of mass is located exactly at the center. There is another mass behind this white box. And what this diagram is also showing you is here's the location of the center of mass. And the location of the center of mass is a distance d1 away from object 1 and a distance d2 away from the center of mass of object 2. The question is, Using the information presented to you in this diagram, what can you say about the mass of object 2 in terms of how it compares to the mass of object 1? Again, with all of the information presented in this diagram, how does the mass of object 2 compare to the mass of object 1? I'd like you to take a minute to pause this video here and think about that. And when you hit play, we'll go over it. Based on the information given in the problem, the mass of object 2 has to be larger than the mass of object 1. Because what this diagram says is the center of mass is farther away from object 1, or I should say it's farther away from objects, object 1's center of mass than it is from object 2's center of mass. And the only reason why the center of mass would be closer to object 2's center of mass than it is to object 1's center of mass is if object 2 had more mass. And so what we'll say here is since the center of mass is farther away from object 1 than it is from object 2, the mass of object 2 is larger than the mass of object 1. Take a second to pause this video here and write that down. And when you hit play, we'll move on. And so there's really not a whole lot to determining the location of the center of mass. If the two objects have the same mass, the center of mass is going to be in between. And if they don't have the same mass, the center of mass is going to be closer to the heavier object. How much closer? Well, ultimately, that depends on the ratio of the masses. You don't actually have to calculate that, though. All you need to know is that it's going to be closer to the heavier object. And of course, if it is a big spread out object, like a sphere or like a big long rod or something, then the center of mass is going to be located exactly at the center of that object. And that's it. Now, of course, a pretty good question, I think, would be, so why are we discussing center of mass when it comes to momentum? And that's a good question. That's because there are a lot of center of mass concepts involved in the momentum unit. And so in my view, it makes a good amount of sense to discuss it now. So the first thing we'll say under center of mass and momentum is that in exactly the same way we discuss center of mass when it comes to regular objects, we can say if there are no external forces acting on the system, the momentum of the center of mass of that system is conserved. 
That's a very important point. The reason why this is a very important point is because if the mass of the system does not change, in order to keep the momentum of the system the same amount, then the velocity of the center of mass must remain the same. It's important to realize that fits in with Newton's laws exactly. Because if the center of mass is maintaining a state of uniform motion, and there are no external forces acting on the center of mass, then the velocity of the center of mass will remain the same. It will continue in that state of uniform motion. I actually want to use a couple of simulators to look at this idea. So take a second to pause this video here and write that down. And when you hit play, we'll take a look at how this works in an actual system. So let's take a look at a little simulator here. In this simulation, and this is on uh, FET, the popular physics uh, education website, you'll see two objects. And you see these two objects, and they have masses which for right now are the same, and velocity shown by these green arrows. And what I have checked here is the center of mass label, which shows you the center of mass is located at that point x. Let's test out a couple of things we said here already. These are two objects which have the same mass. Look at the location of the center of mass. If we put a grid up here, the location of the center of mass should be unsurprising. Let's double the mass of object one. Notice when I double the mass of object one, the center of mass moves closer to that object. If I now increase the mass of object two to one, then it goes back to being directly between them. And of course, if I increase the mass of object two, then the center of mass moves closer to object two. Now, of course, this is basically everything we already said, but let's take a look at how it works when the objects are in motion. So let's just sort of randomly set these masses with their different values. Notice here the, the center of mass is much, much closer to object one than it is to object two. And we're just going to have these objects go in a collision. Very carefully, I want you to watch the location of the x. One more time. Notice in the very beginning, and I'm going to actually slow this down here. Notice in the very beginning, before the objects collide, the center of mass is moving to the right. Now that the objects are stuck together, it doesn't matter. The center of mass is moving to the right. Now, if we actually show the values here, it's a little hard to see because this is still uh, like a beta version of this. So these are kind of all on top of each other. But the velocity of the center of mass is shown as 0 0.26 meters per second. The individual speeds of these objects are shown as 0 0.5, but the velocity of the center of mass is 0 0.26. And when they collide, because that force is internal to the system, the velocity of the center of mass stays the same. Now, notice here, if I increase the mass of object 1 even more, then what we'll see is the center of mass move a little faster because object one is the object that's really dominating. Notice that still holds true as I decrease the mass of object two. Now, because the mass of object one is so much bigger than the mass of object two, the center of mass of the system is almost right on top of object one. And we still see the center of mass maintains its velocity in the absence of an external force. Notice here, when it hits the wall, the center of mass was moving, and now it's not moving. One more time. Center of mass maintains its value 0.47. The second there's an external force, boom, the object stops. That's because the system existed in the absence of an external force. And then when there was an external force, the velocity of the center of mass changed. That's the idea. The velocity of the center of mass will always remain the same, except for when there's an external force. And now notice we could just play with this a little more to really kind of show uh, the difference, you know, and, and how all this stuff works. So I'm just going to mess with the velocities here and really change them around. Uh, I can change this velocity to three. And so notice here, this velocity is huge. The center of mass is going to be moving pretty quickly to the right. Its motion does not change, even though the objects collide. That's because the force is internal to the system.
And so that's the deal. If the mass of the system does not change in order to keep the momentum of the system the same amount, the velocity of the center of mass must remain the same. So if the velocity of the center of mass starts at some value, it's going to remain at that value. And if the center of mass was always at rest, then the center of mass is going to remain at rest. And we can actually test that out very quickly before we move on here. And so if we set up these values to even make this a perfectly elastic collision, notice here these objects are going to bounce off each other. And the center of mass, notice it keeps doing the same thing. Now we can see here further, it does the same thing, does the same thing, does the same thing, continues doing the same thing. The second there's an external force exerted on the system, now it changes direction and it moves. But notice we can set this up in such a way where we make the masses of the objects exactly the same, and we make the velocities of these objects exactly the same, one's positive, one's negative. And if you remember, in a perfectly elastic collision, if the objects have the same mass, the objects simply exchange velocities. Look at the center of mass. It's at rest. It continues to remain at rest until there's that external force, and then it starts moving. And so we can set this up a little better maybe if we make this uh, negative 0.5 so it's not going to hit the wall as soon. Here they go, they collide, they exchange velocities, center of mass remains at rest until we get that external force, and then it starts moving. Another external force starts moving again. No external forces. It remains at the same location. Now we're going to have an external force. Watch the X, boom, and it changes again. That's the idea. It's not that complicated. Let's take a look at an example of a problem. This problem here, center of mass discussion question, says a two-cart system, along with the compressed spring connecting the cart, or that should say the carts, uh, are traveling to the right in a straight line with a speed V as shown in the diagram below. Of course, there is no diagram below yet because I'm going to draw it. So here we have these two carts. There's the first cart. There's a spring connecting them. It's sort of like in a housing in both of these objects. Here's the second cart. And the mass of the cart on the left is four kilograms. The mass of the cart on the right is one kilogram. It says the spring is then released. The cart on the left is launched with the speed VL, and the cart on the right is launched with the speed VR, where VR is bigger than the speed V that these carts were initially moving along at in the beginning. So these carts were moving to the right, the spring explodes, this one goes to the right, this one goes back to the left. It says, which of the following is true of the speed V sub C of the center of mass of the system after the spring is released? Take a second to pause this video here and think about the answer to this question and why the answer might be what it is. And when you hit play, we'll go over it. Okay, so the key detail here is that the center of mass was moving along with both carts. Since both carts were moving at a speed V, the center of mass was moving at a speed V. And so because the center of mass was originally moving at a speed V, and there are no external forces exerted on the system, the center of mass continues moving at a speed V. For our explanation here, we can write, since there are no external forces acting on the spring cart system, the momentum of the center of mass is conserved, which means the velocity of the center of mass doesn't change. Since the velocity of the center of mass doesn't change, and the center of mass was initially moving with the velocity of V, it'll always have the velocity of V. I want to actually go ahead and look at this in a simulation, but I'd like you to take a second to pause this video here and write that down. And when you hit play, we'll move on. So let's take a look at this simulator here. Here we have these two objects, they are connected. They're about to explode. And so we'll make the simulation slow here just to make everything that's happening perfectly clear. And we'll even have this thing show us a grid. And we're going to run it. So you'll notice here in the beginning, these objects are going to be moving together. And eventually they're going to explode. I guess we'll have to make this go a little faster. And so they're moving, they're moving, they're moving. It's about to explode. We'll make this go faster because it's taking a little too long. And eventually, they're going to explode. Watch the center of mass. See how it's moving. Try to track it with my mouse. It's about to explode. 0 0.2, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 0 0.
There it goes. The explosion happens. Notice the center of mass is still chugging along with the exact same speed. The reason why the center of mass still chugs along with the exact same speed is because the momentum is conserved. Notice here, the initial momentum of the red box was 10, and the initial momentum of the blue box was 50. And because they're moving in the same direction, that means the total momentum of the system is 60. 50 plus 10 is 60. They're moving in the same direction. Now, after the explosion happens, and I'll pause it one more time here just to show, after the explosion happens, we can see that the momentum of the blue box increases by 3.416, but the momentum of the red box decreases by 3.416, making the total momentum still 60. That's the deal. The center of mass maintains the same velocity because the momentum is conserved. So despite the fact that center of mass is a new concept, it really fits in quite nicely with everything else that we've said about momentum. All right, now quickly before we go, I just want to talk about one more problem that you could expect to see on the AP test, because they've asked about it before. It has to do with the center of mass of a person walking on a dock. Now, of course, this is a ridiculous animation. It was not the one they showed in the actual question on the AP test, but it gives the idea, which is why I decided to show it. So they're going to say here, you have a person standing on some dock, and the person is going to walk from point A to point B, as shown in the diagram. And when they walk from point A to point B, the dock moves. Now, it should make sense why the dock moves, because the person has to exert a friction force on the dock in order to be able to move. The way this work is the way this works is shown here in this video. So you can see here this kid walks to the right. And so as a result, the paddleboard's got to move to the left. When the kid walks to the left, the paddleboard moves to the right. That's the idea. To just show one more time, kid walks to the right, board moves to the left, and then walks back to the left, and the board moves to the right. That's the basic idea. There's frictional contact between the feet and the dock which is why the person moves back and forth. And so the point of this question, and I'd like you to sketch this in your notes, the point of this question is to find this distance x. And so the question is, how do we actually do that? I want you to take a second to draw these two pictures in your notes. And when you hit play, we'll go over to an how to answer this question as the last thing for today. Okay, so the first thing we need to do in order to answer this question is to figure out what's happening with the center of mass. It should be clear to everybody that if the only force the dock is experiencing is the force of friction from the man's feet, then there are no external forces exerted on the system. And what that tells us is the momentum of the center of mass remains the same. Now, of course, the question is, what is the momentum of the center of mass? Well, the person on the dock is just standing there. So their velocity is zero. The dock is just sitting there. Its velocity is zero. So that means the original momentum of the center of mass is zero. And since there are no external forces exerted on the system, the final momentum should also be zero. And the point of this question, I think, is fairly straightforward. If the momentum of the center of mass has to stay the same, and momentum is mass times velocity, and the mass of the system doesn't change, that means the velocity of the center of mass doesn't change either. So all we really need to do here is locate the center of mass. The first thing we should say is that the center of mass of the man is going to be located at the edge of the dock. Now, this diagram is a little puffed up here, but the center of mass of the man is located at the very end of the dock, because that's where they're standing. The animation is not to scale. They're standing on the very edge of the dock. Because the dock is uniform, and the dock is the same mass as the man, this is just an assumption we're making, the center of mass of the dock is exactly at the center of the dock. So this 
is the center of mass of the dock. And this is the center of mass of the man. If the mass of the man is equal to the mass of the dock, then that means the center of mass of the system is located exactly between their centers of mass. For any two objects with equal mass, the center of mass is exactly between their centers of mass. Remember, we said that already. So the question is, how far is that away from the shore? Well, if the dock is 10 meters long, that means the center of the mass of the man is at 10 meters. And the center of mass of the dock is at 5 meters. So that means the center of mass of the system is 7.5 meters away from the shore. That's the first big thing you need to realize about this question. Take a second to pause this video here and write that down. And when you hit play, we'll move on to the next part. Moving on then, when the person moves, notice the location of the man is different. The location of the dock is different. But what doesn't change is the location of the center of mass of the system. The location of the center of mass of the system is still seven and a half meters from the shore. That's the important point. And so the center of mass of the dock is here, and the center of mass of the person, or the man, is here. And so here's the deal. Because the center of mass is still 7.5 meters from the shore, and the center of mass is exactly between their centers of mass, then that means the center of mass of the system and the end of the dock are 2.5 meters away. That's the idea. And so because these centers of mass, the center of mass of the system and the center of mass of the man, are 2.5 meters away, and the location of the center of the mass of the system is 7.5 meters from the shore, that means x is 5 meters. Now, this on the AP test is a multiple choice question, so you won't need to go nuts about the explanation. But being able to understand this to answer this is very important. I think at first glance it is a little confusing. So make sure you go back and watch this part of the video again if it's confusing you. And if you have any questions about this problem, please let me know. But with that, that's it for today. Have a good one, everybody.